question. Yes, sir. Uh, my wife and I have gone through a long journey. We've studied with you for years. Came out of Christianity, came out of Mormonism. We were most uh, awestruck by your description and then our follow-up research on the intentional corruption of the Christian scriptures. That blew us away. Could you recap some of the key corruptions by the Christian authors, both of the New Testament and of the Old Testament? Wow, okay, sure. <laughs> and you serve breakfast in Antwerp. Here's one example of this. Now, the question is, Lee asked, can you give us examples of where the Christian Bible altered the Jewish scriptures in order to make it appear Christological? And then you went even further and, and, and asked, can you provide examples of where the Christian Bible corrupted the Christian Bible in order to advance theological doctrines. So those would be very easy to do and give you an example of each. There's so many, where do you choose from? Um, let's, I know you're all expecting Matthew. So Matthew is one of two authors in the New Testament that we find an infancy narrative. When in the book of Mark, chronologically the oldest gospel, written about the time of the destruction of the second temple, we're introduced to Jesus as, as an adult. It begins with an incipit, and then we have the baptism. Okay? So there's nothing about Jesus' birth in the book of Mark, and whoever wrote the book knew nothing about it, or just didn't think that a miraculous conception was important enough to mention. In fact, Joseph is never even mentioned by the author of the book of Mark. But in Matthew and Luke, we have an infancy narrative, two chapters for each. Matthew does what Luke doesn't do in that he says, the fact that Jesus was conceived to a virgin is not an ordinary event. It was foretold by the prophets and then completely misquotes Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. So if you read Matthew 123, it would say, behold, the Lord of his own will give you a sign. Uh, incidentally, the context is that Joseph is receiving this revelation. In Matthew's gospel, it's Joseph that receives the revelations, and in Luke's gospel, it's Mary that's receiving these revelations in an annunciation. Why the two are different? You're welcome to ask that, but it's beyond the scope of the question. Matthew is very unique here. This is one of 11 fulfillment citations, and this is a fill what was said by the prophets. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means that God is with us. If you had a Christian study Bible, it would tell you that you will find that verse in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. When you look up Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, it just isn't there. It's not only that critical word we're looking for, virgin isn't there. The word that appears in Isaiah 4, 7, 14 is, hine ho alma hora, behold, the young woman is pregnant. Incidentally, it is young women that have babies as opposed to old women. There's nothing unusual about this. The word Alma appears in Tanakh. And as you would guess, where it appears in other places in the Jewish scriptures, the Christian Bibles translate it and render it correctly. And as it turns out, people like King David are called in Elam in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 56, in chapter 20, verse 22. You could write that down. And in the book of Psalms, chapter 89, verse 46 in the Jewish Bible, and verse 35 in a Christian Bible, it says there, Hiksarta yemei alumov, translated, you have cut off the days of his youth. Every Christian Bible translates that word as youth, young, all of them do. Does it really mean that you have cut off the days of his virginity? How ridiculous. Hine ho'amo means behold the young woman. Matthew can't let the definite article stand, expunges it and puts in an indefinite article. A virgin changes the tense 
And the text actually says, Hine Almohora, which means it's in the perfect tense, past tense. She is already pregnant. Matthew can't have that. So Matthew mistranslates that mis and puts it in, behold, she will conceive. It doesn't say that in the text. So, and if you look at the context in Isaiah chapter 7, it has nothing to do with the Messiah. And the context is, is an Ephro-Serio war that is unfolding where the northern kingdom of Israel at that time during the Assyrian Empire, the, the Jewish nation was divided, split into two parts, and the northern kingdom allied itself with Syria and went to war against the southern kingdom of Judah. The king of the time was Ahaz. And Ahaz was an enormous amount of trouble and God delivered him, not because he deserved it. He was a horribly wicked king. The case could easily be made he was the most wicked king that the Davidic dynasty ever had. He never repented like Menashe. What possible comfort could a, a virgin birth 700 years later provide for a man who's surrounded by two enemy armies? So this is where just one example, there's so many, where the Christian Bible completely alters the Hebrew Bible in order to make it appear Christological. It's famous, you've heard of it, I've given you the sources. And they say that, how do you know I'm telling you the truth? Well, you go to 1 Samuel 17:56, and you find an example of that word used, Elem, which is the mask for Alma. The point is, are you therefore saying that King David was a virgin? This is, how ridiculous. Okay, is there, please look it up for yourself. Okay, now you ask the question, when does the Christian Bible alter the Christian Bible? And I, I'm sure some people found it to be a very puzzling question, but as it turns out, it's a very important question because as it turned out, uh, the different writers of the Gospels had different, there were different views, different theological views on, for example, let me give a very famous, the idea that Jesus died as a ransom for your sins. Vicarious atonement, that Jesus' death directly atoned for your sins. Now you will find that in three out of the four Gospels. You will find that in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 45. And the book of Matthew, for example, in chapter 20, verse 28. You will not find that verse anywhere in the book of Luke. We don't know who wrote the book of Luke. These ascriptions of authorship are from the late second century, dating to Irenaeus about the year 180. We don't know who wrote the book. The books don't falsely acclaim to be somebody, as other books do, but these books are anonymously written. Whoever wrote the book of Luke did not believe that Jesus died vicariously for somebody's sins. And in Luke's view, we, again, I'm using the word Luke because it's convenient, it's conventional. Nowhere in the book of Luke or the book of Acts is the author identified. It's a Christian tradition dating from late second century, but we're going to use these terms because it just works. So in Luke's view, in Luke Acts view, book of Acts is just volume two of the book of Luke. If you're not sure, just read the opening passage and you'll see it's the same author. So in the book of Luke, if you think about Jesus' death on the cross, that will cause you to repent. And it is the repentance that atones for your sins. And therefore, there cannot be a, a Eucharist in any conventional sense. So the Eucharist, Take this bread, the body. I gave it for your sins in Matthew chapter 26, in Mark chapter 14, in Luke chapter 22, and strikingly in John chapter 6. The only thing is that Luke didn't believe in that. And the best manuscripts we have of Luke, and I'm specifically referring to, to now Luke chapter 22, verse 19 and 20, half of verse 19 of chapter 22, and all of chapter 20 is a later interpolation. That's a complete corruption, so that Luke's Eucharist matches perfectly, lines up with that of Matthew and Mark and John. The only thing is Luke's order is different. The wine is, comes before the bread, but that's not really important. Corruptions, the doctrine of the Trinity was interpolated into the first John 
chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. There are three that bear witness. That was all put in. We know that. I mean, the, there's no resurrection account in the book of Mark. There is none. It, the book of Mark originally ended in verse 8. The women are told that Jesus rode and they rose and they were frightened and said nothing to anyone. End, book ends. All of our best manuscripts lack those last 12 verses. A complete corruption. Later scribes found it very troubling that Mark does not possess any resurrection accounts as you would find in Matthew, Luke, and John. And therefore those last 12 verses have, were interpolated later. Virtually all Christian scholars acknowledge that the last 12 verses of Mark, which is really significant. There are another very famous 12 verses that happen to appear at the, in the book of John, the story of the adulterous woman, the last passage of John chapter 7, and the first 11 passages of John chapter 8. That whole story was added in later. Our earliest texts lack them. But the, it's, a, it's a story that's so moving that it makes it into every Christian movie. I mean, it's not even a passion narrative, but Mel Gibson, like, we have to get it in there somehow, right? So it's in a flashback, you know, we got to get it in. The corruptions are endless where the texts are changed. You'd have to go to the manuscripts further in Luke's passion narrative. So there are seven endings of what Jesus says on the cross. And Luke famously have Jesus saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. There are Christian editors who didn't find it satisfying that Jesus called for the forgiveness of the Jews. And in some very, very famous manuscripts, it isn't there. But, you know, though, I mean, these go on and on. So the church was perfectly willing and able to alter its own texts to insert Trinitarian passages because they knew that if you don't have 1 John 5, 7, and 8, then you have not a single verse in the entire Christian Bible that succinctly and clearly conveys the doctrine of the Trinity as it was hammered out in Nicaea in 325. All you have is inferences. That's all you have. Go into all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. There's nothing that tells you about the relationship of them and so on. All you have is these inferences. So the Christian Bible is like just bullet holes. It looks like, you know, when you when you're target practicing and just full of bullets, it's altered, 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 in order so that it conformed with orthodoxy. The, the church's doctrines would evolve very quickly, rapidly in the second, third century, and then adjustments had to be made to the text to cooperate, to comport with those alterations. I mean, this really could be till breakfast, but those are just examples. Anyways, thank you for your question. I don't know love. אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו, אם לא חנוך